Hold on, I gotta get a couple photos. <laughs> this isn't part of my this isn't part of my presentation time. I just need some photos for everybody. <laughs> Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Not yet. No, not yet. No, no Friday hug right now. This is just, this is Aaron time right now. This is Aaron time. You're going to have to, you're going to have to wait for Friday hugs. <laughs> this is a, there's a special portion of my presentation for Friday hugs. So let's, let's wait a second. I'm going to, I'm choosing to stay behind the podium because I'm not wearing any pants. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I am wearing pants, it's true, you can see. Okay, so uh, this is the title of my talk, Mark Compact GC and MRI. My name is Aaron, hello. Um, I am a 20-something hipster nerd <laughs> who is now a 30-something hipster nerd. <laughs> uh, my name is Tender Love. If you don't recognize me in person, this is what I look like on the internet. Um, Yesterday I was, I was very jet lagged. I'm still a little bit jet lagged, but yesterday I just, this is how I felt yesterday was, it's Friday Junior, yay, Thursday. Um, but today, 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 today is Friday, so let's weekend. <laughs> now, now is the time for Friday hugs. I want everybody to stand up and I want you to give the internet a hug with me. This is a, tradition that I do, and I'll explain why in a minute. Okay. All right, everybody. One, two, three. Happy Friday! Happy Friday! Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I, I do this, I do this every Friday, I hug the internet, and the reason I do it is because I work from home and I get kind of lonely, so the internet, the internet is my water cooler, so that's how I say hello everyone. Uh, I was actually in, I was in Japan a couple weeks ago, uh, and I decided to go to some uh, retirement homes and do Friday hugs there, and this is, this is a photo of one of them. <laughs> You're doing Friday hugs there. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding, that's not true. This is a real photo, but I was not there. Uh, I'm on the Ruby core team and the Rails core team, uh, and I have a quiz for you today. Uh, is this uh, Ruby or Rails? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all right. Uh, I work for a company called uh, GitHub. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. This is a, <laughs> a small company I work for. Um, it is, uh, I, I, have to, I have to make this joke at every conference. It is the only legit company I've ever worked for. Um, <laughs> So this is, this is not, <laughs> thank you, thank you. This is not to be confused with Matt's presentation where he was showing off uh, legit. Uh, uh, but I thought it was kind of cool because he posted the link to it and it was on GitHub, so it was legit on Git. Uh, uh, but I actually was Googling around and I, I well, I, I forked the JIT project. So there is actually two of them, so now it's, it's too legit and those are too legit on, on Git. <laughs> yes! <laughs> those of you who grew up in the 80s know what I'm talking about. All right, so anyway, I love using Git, but I will not force push it on you. Um, <laughs> So I work for I work for GitHub as a uh, Ruby and Rails developer, and what I mean by that is I actually work on Ruby and Rails for GitHub. So uh, fortunately, GitHub allows me to do open source development as my as my uh, full time job. Though I have recently become Mr. Manager, um, but I still do open source development and Mr. Managing as well. Uh, so anyway, I I get to work on open source code all day, and I just want to say like. You know, GitHub loves open source, and I'm extremely grateful that they let me do this. Uh, I have two cats. Uh, this one is SeaTac Airport, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, I didn't include the Instagram part, uh, and she's just Choo Choo for short. This is the more famous one. His name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse, uh, and they, <laughs> or Gorby Puff for short, they love each other very much. Uh, Actually, that's not true. He, he hates her, and she loves him, and they just... So she always snuggles with him, and he gets annoyed and leaves. But <laughs> they, they, they're 
totally experts in getting in my way. Uh, for example, they like to sleep on my keyboard like this, and this is like, this is a, I, I'm constantly cleaning hair out of my keyboard because of these, these cats. Uh, I'm a mechanical keyboard enthusiast. I love mechanical keyboards, uh, and I'm gonna show you, this is, my, this is my list of my mechanical keyboards. I own five ErgoDox keyboards. Uh, three of them are Infinity Ergodoxes, one of them's an Ergodox EZ, and the other one's the original. I own two Planks and one Atreus. And this is uh, very sad. This is thousands of dollars of keyboards right here. <laughs> I shouldn't spend so much money on these things, but I do. Uh, this, is my, this is my daily driver one. This is the Infinity Ergodox. That's the one I use daily. Uh, all the other ergodoxes look very similar to this one, but this is my daily use one. Uh, this is my travel keyboard. So this is what a plank looks like. I have this one here with me today, so if you want to take a look at that afterwards, please come say hello to me and I will show it to you and you can type on it. And it's very loud and I want you to enjoy how loud it is. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is the Atreus keyboard. This is an interesting, interesting keyboard as well. I, I like this keyboard a lot. Uh, but I don't travel with it because uh, this one fits more keys into a smaller space and it's easier to pack, although I do love this keyboard. Uh, I also have a, I'm, I figured, you know, I was putting in these slides about my keyboards. I figured I may as well show off all the other crap that's on my desk. Uh, <laughs> so I, I also use an L-Track mouse. This is a, this is a uh, roller mouse and that is my cat lying there in the background. And the reason I got this mouse is because, well, I, I was having RSI problems, but also uh, the cats kept sleeping on my mouse pad. So this was the this is the situation I was living with. Like I could barely use the mouse pad, and it would get really bad, like that, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to move them out of the way because I feel bad. But uh, actually, I reviewed this mouse pad. If you go on Amazon, I reviewed this mouse pad, <laughs> and there's like thousands and thousands of comments on my review for this mouse pad. <laughs> Because I think the title of the mouse pad was like, uh, it was, I really enjoy the uh, 50, 25 to 50% of this mouse pad that I can use at any time. <laughs> so it is a, it is a popular, popular review on Amazon. So that's actually how people know me is this, this review. <laughs> uh, I use a Norman layout. Uh, this is different than uh, Dvorak or QWERTY. It's actually based off of QWERTY where they uh, moved as few keys as possible, but to improve your, like, improve typing. Uh, it took, a, took me about three weeks to learn that. So I, I have a completely custom setup, and what that means is that I'm totally useless on a laptop, basically. <laughs> uh, now, the reason I did all this stuff is because at one point I had really bad RSI issues. Like, I couldn't type at all. I, my hands were just hurting all the time. And I realized the reason, the reason I was getting these pains in my hand is because I wasn't thinking about my work environment at all. At all. Like, I just would type on whatever, and I don't care how I sat or it didn't matter even though I was spending you know however many hours a day at a, at a desk so I never really thought about that much at all and I once I started thinking about it and actually getting into this stuff that's the reason I spent so much money on these keyboards and things was to make sure I didn't get that pain again so what I want to pass on to you today is to think about your work environment and to invest in yourself Don said this earlier yes call back to you uh, so Make sure to be thinking about your work environment so that you don't get injured like I did. Uh, you don't want to get injured and then do this stuff. You should do it in advance, please. Or So please invest in yourself or treat yourself, as I like to say. Um, I also love puns. Uh, <laughs> but sequel puns make me very absurd. Uh, <laughs> so no sequel puns, please. Uh, I <laughs> yes, take a photo. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about error messages. There was an awesome talk yesterday uh, about error messages, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed that presentation. Uh, and I want to tell you about my relationship with error messages, and that's that I have an incredibly short attention span. Uh, I like to cure meat, and this is. This is some of the sausage that I make. Like, I made some sausage at home, and uh, I promise this relates to error messages. Uh, 
So I, I like to make sausages. This is, this is uh, some pancetta that I made. I made this. I also enjoy making bacon, though I couldn't find any photos of it for some reason. Uh, and I love to make... <laughs> oh, she's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so I love, I love to cure meats and stuff, and I, I want to make bacon, and when you go buy it at the store, it was about four ninety nine a pound, and okay, that, that's for expensive bacon, and I apologize for the imperial units, but it doesn't really matter because I've used the same units throughout, so you can figure out the price. Uh, it's four ninety nine per some unit. Um, now, when I went to make my own bacon, I, w I had to buy raw pork belly, to cure it myself. And unfortunately, when I went to buy that, that ended up being $5.25 per pound. And that really bothered me because the, the raw pork belly was more expensive than the cured pork belly, and presumably they had done more, more processing on that. So it bugged me that I wanted to make my own at home and I wasn't saving any money doing it. Uh, so I went around to several stores and kept buying these raw pork bellies, and they, I noticed that they kept coming in the same box. And no matter what butcher I went to, they would, they would put it in the same box, and I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. So I figured out where the box came from, and I found out that it was actually a wholesaler. And I found out if I went and bought these pork bellies from the wholesaler, they were about $2.25 a pound. So that was a great discount. Unfortunately, if you wanted to buy pork bellies from a wholesaler, you actually had to have a business license. So I needed to incorporate a business, and that's, where I, that's why I started my consulting company, uh, Adequate Industries. <laughs> Do everything adequately. <laughs> so I started this consulting business so that I could go buy, go buy these pork bellies. Now, when I filled out the online forums, it cost about, I don't know, $40 to start a business. And I was filling out the online forums, and like, they, keep, they kept asking me these questions. This is where the short attention span comes in. They kept asking me these questions, and I didn't know how to answer them. So I would just like, like I'd fill out the forum, and it would give me some errors, and my eyes would glaze over because I didn't understand the errors. So I would just fill out, keep filling out stuff, like putting in stuff and checking stuff until it finally let me through. And I'm not quite sure what I put into the form, uh, but it let me through, and they took, the government took my money. So I figured, I must have done everything right, right? They, they wouldn't take my money unless I did it right. <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, fast forward, like I had the business for maybe three years or so. Uh, and I get, a, I get a call one day from, a, from an auditor from the city. And she says to me, uh, your business isn't set up correctly. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> 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 and so she explained to me, she explained to me what was wrong with the business and I had no idea what she was talking about. And I'm like, I don't know, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she said, well, yes, your, your business is set up completely wrong. And I said, well, yes, but you took my money. So why did you take my money if it's all set up wrong? And she's like, well, I don't know, but uh, you're gonna have to pay some fines. And I'm like, oh, geez. And, <laughs> So she says, well, how much, you know, how much money have you made with the business? And I'm like, I don't make any money with the business. I omitted the part about pork bellies. Uh, <laughs> I don't make any money with the business. So uh, <laughs> she said, okay, well, uh, you don't have, then you don't have to pay any fines, but we, we want to close down your, your business. We want to close it. And I said, okay, that's fine. I don't want to pay any, I don't want to pay anything. You can go ahead and close it down. So she says, okay, great, closes it down. And then about two weeks later, I get a letter from the city asking me whether or not I wanted to renew my business. Uh, so I replied yes and sent a check. And <laughs> so I may or may not still have a business. <laughs> Not totally sure. Anyway, so that, that is my, my saga of error <laughs> messages. Um, so anyway, let, let's move on a bit. I want to say, say thank you. Thank you to the organizers for having me. Uh, thank you, all of you, for coming here today. I love coming to Singapore. This is my fourth or fifth time, I think, at this, at this conference. I love being here. The talks are always amazing. I saw some of the best talks this year I've seen so far. I learn so much when I'm here. And... I enjoy talking to the people because 
There are so many talented engineers here. I always leave feeling inspired. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you. Uh oh, are we okay? Are we okay? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That was me. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about Mark Compact GC for MRI. This is this is an ongoing development that we're doing at Git, GitHub. Uh, last year, I spoke about garbage collection as well, and at the end of my talk, I proposed a proposed a thing called um, an idea called heap splitting. And we were working on that at, at GitHub, and we ended up abandoning the project. So uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, I am a failure of a software engineer. So I am now a senior software engineer telling you that I am not that great at programming. But anyway, we abandoned that project for a different project called uh, Compaction. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, I actually introduced Compaction a tiny bit last year and said that it was something that um, was impossible to do. Uh, with MRI, but it turns out I was wrong. So I, I am frequently wrong, apparently, uh, as I was about heap splitting. So we're going to talk about uh, compaction this, this year. Now, uh, Ruby already has a marking compacting GC, and so we're not really going to focus too much on the mark side of this. We're going to talk about the compaction side. Uh, but in order to talk about a compacting garbage collector, we actually have to have two things already. We need to have objects, uh, and we need to have free space. We have to have something to compact, and we have, have to have some place to compact them into. Uh, so the roadmap is going to be, we're going to look at how allocations work, uh, then collections, then we'll focus on compaction and move into the actual implementation details of uh, compaction. And I took a page from Juanito's talk yesterday and res reserved this slide for local jokes. Uh, so if you have any local jokes, please tell them to me later. <laughs> <laughs> so first, let's talk about allocation. Now, this is an example of some code that allocates a whole bunch of objects, obviously. Uh, but when we execute this code, where do those objects go? Like, where, where do they actually get put, and what actually allocates them? What I think is interesting is that uh, allocation is actually the garbage collector's responsibility. And when you, it, I thought that was always weird. When you hear the name garbage collector, you think, oh, it's actually getting rid of any garbage. But actually, creating garbage is also the garbage collector's job as well. So it's not just the garbage collector. It is also a garbage producer, um, which is interesting to me. And if you look through Ruby's code, the source code, the, the source of all objects comes from a function called rbnewobj. So if you want to dive into the code, go look for this, go look for this function. And you can read through it and learn how uh, objects are allocated. Uh, this function actually searches the memory space for a new place to put the object and returns that object back to you. Uh, so the way that Ruby actually divides the computer's memory is we have a heap, which is some amount of memory. Uh, Ruby actually divides that heap into pages, so we have many pages. Then it divides those pages further into objects, so each of the pages have objects. And whenever we allocate an object, we look for a space in one of those pages. Uh, and if there is space, then we put an object there. And if there is no space, then we'll allocate a new page, and then we'll put objects in that, in that new page. When we have to allocate a new page, that's called a slow path allocation. So we say, give me an object. I'm going to, uh, if there's no room, then the process will actually go allocate a page and then put that object there. This is called a slow path allocation because we have to go through all the work of creating a new page. Uh, if there is free space, that's called a fast path allocation. It's, it's because all we have to do is just return that object back. We have, we have space for it. So when you're running your application in production, you want to reduce the number of slow path allocations that you're doing in production and in increase the number of fast path allocations. So in order to do that, you can tweak some of the garbage, collector, uh, garbage collection uh, knobs, and the one to tweak is this one called RBGC heap free slots, and this basically says the number of slots that we're going to have available. Uh, so we tune ours up fairly high at GitHub such that uh, when a request comes through, we don't have to do any slow path allocations. All of them are fast paths, so we keep a large heap. These pages are also called arenas. Uh, if you hear that term, it's essentially the same thing, just an, an amount of memory that we, we allocate in some place. So if we look further into a page layout, I said pages are where we store new objects. But what actually happens is when we allocate a page, that page gets 
pre-filled with a bunch of free slots. So we have a bunch of these free, free areas in a page. And when you allocate objects, the, out, the objects get put into those free slots as we're running our program. So it'll go through there and allocate, put them into those free slots. Now, uh, when, a, when objects get freed, they actually go away from those, free sl those slots and they just get turned into free slots again. The objects go away. When they're GC'd, they get turned into free slots. Uh, and then we can reuse those slots later. Now, slots are fixed width, which, uh, so each object is only 40 bytes wide. Uh, but that's kind of interesting when you think about it. Like, if a Ruby object is only 40 bytes, how do we store things like hashes or arrays? We know hashes grow larger than 40 bytes, so, so how does that actually work? Uh, the way this works is, if we have memory like this, our computer's memory, and we have some page in the memory, uh, when we allocate objects in there, let's say we have some kind of hash object in there, what we'll do is we'll allocate what's called an ST hash structure out on, on the heap. It's not actually allocated inside of that page. It's allocated somewhere else uh, in the computer's memory. And the way that we actually allocate those ST hashes is with the, the malloc call. Now, when uh, a GC occurs and we want to free that hash, it's the hash's responsibility to say, OK, uh, before I get freed, I'm going to call the free function on the ST hash. Now that ST hash will get freed up, and then the garbage collector will free the Ruby hash object itself. So that's how we're able to store objects larger than 40 bytes uh, in the computer's memory. And this will be important a little bit later. So, uh, this memory up at the top here, that's managed by the system allocator, where that slice at the bottom is managed by the garbage collector. Now, interesting facts about these two areas are that we can control the layout and the format uh, of objects that are allocated inside of the GC. So we can move those things around and manipulate them. But the ones that are outside, those system allocations, we can't necessarily control where those are. Uh, with the system allocator. We can do some little tricks, uh, but we don't have nearly as much control over them as we do with uh, al objects allocated in the GC. So anything allocated in the GC is much, uh, much better for us than if it's a system allocated. So in summary, uh, we're going to summarize this in Ruby code. A heap has many pages. A page has many slots. A slot can either be empty or have an object. Those are the conditions of our, of our memory. Uh, so when we look at collection, we're going to talk about collection. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the uh, last year, but we're going to do a little refresher because it's important to understand how collection works in order to see the tricks we can do with compaction. So Ruby uses a mark and sweep garbage collector, and the algorithm roughly goes something like this. If we have uh, Ruby objects, those Ruby objects form a tree in memory. Uh, this is kind of what the tree looks like. Now, if we cut one of those, cut one of those slice, those uh, arrows from the tree, we actually have to free up all of those things, and that's where the garbage collector comes in. We cut that relationship; it frees those, frees those objects. So the actual, uh, the actual algorithm has two different parts: uh, the mark, uh, mark part, and the sweep part, uh, which is why it's called a mark and sweep garbage collector. So the way this works is if we have some, sort of, have some sort of tree, we go through what is called a mark phase, and we walk through the tree, starting from the root. So in this particular example, we'll go from the root to A to F, and then from F to D, B, and C, and then from uh, the D, we go back to A, and anything at the end of this mark phase that hasn't been marked, we free it. So that's what happens. Those all get, those all get freed, and that's the overview of a mark and sweep mark and sweep implementation. Now, the thing that actually marks those edges is a function called uh, GC mark, uh, and that's going to be important later. Where is that GC mark? Right there. So that, that function is what marks those arrows. So it's important. This function name is important, and we'll look at it later. So if we were to look at this in Ruby code, uh, we would say, like, hey, object, give me your references. I'm going to walk through each of the references and call uh, GC mark on this. Now, the downside of mark and sweep is that it's kind of a slow, slow algorithm. But there are different tricks that we can do to increase the speed of the algorithm, such as uh, incremental, incremental marking and lazy sweeping. And we actually discussed those uh, in depth last year. So if you want to know more about that, watch the, watch the talk. Uh, now, on to compacting. Uh, we looked at how objects are created and destroyed, but how does this actually relate to compacting? Now, let's say we have a bunch of objects like this. 
uh, and we free up some of those objects like that. Uh, the amount of memory that's actually consumed is still the size of all of those pages. Even though we freed up all of those objects, we didn't actually decrease the size of the memory, right? Now, let's say we're freeing more objects and all of a sudden that top page becomes free. In this particular case, what will happen is when the page becomes completely free, Ruby will actually free that page up so it goes away and now we're able to reduce the amount of memory that the, the process uses. So now what if we have a situation like this where we freed up many objects and the sum of those objects equals the size of one page? Now if we could move those objects around, it would be nice to move them around like this and then we could actually free up that page like that. So unfortunately today objects can't move. So if we can't do this in Rubies that you have installed on your produ production machines today. Uh, and this is where compaction comes in. And this is the work that we've been doing at GitHub, is working on a compacting garbage collector. Uh, and you can actually find all of these, all of these changes here. So this is, this is the uh, LeGC. <laughs> LeGC on legit. Uh, sorry. So if you want to find all that work, it's, it's up here on GitHub. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the actual compacting side of this now. Uh, the compaction algorithm, algorithm that we're going we're gonna to talk about is called two-finger compaction. There's actually many, many different compaction algorithms, but this is the one that we implemented. Uh, it's called two-finger compaction. Uh, yes, I was playing with Keynote, and it was fun. <laughs> so the downside of this particular, this particular um, algorithm, the first disadvantage this algorithm has is that it's not very efficient, and you'll see, you'll see the algorithm in action a little bit later. And the second problem with this algorithm is that it actually places objects in a random, random locations in memory. Uh, you'll see why in a minute here. But the, the major advantage behind this algorithm is that it's actually very simple to understand and simple to implement. Uh, with, and I am very lazy, so those things appeal to me greatly. <laughs> so the, the algorithm has two steps, which is moving objects and updating references. So it, first it moves the objects, and then it actually updates all the references for the objects. And we're going to look at the algorithm here. So the algorithm starts, this is, a, this is a page that we have with some free slots in it and some objects on the slots. And up at the top there, those are the actual addresses of the objects. So it starts out by putting uh, two pointers on either end of, either end of the, uh, the page. And the left pointer is called the free pointer. The right pointer is called the scan pointer. And what happens is the left pointer moves to the right until it finds a free slot. And the right pointer moves to the left until it finds an object. And when those two things happen, it swaps those two. So in this case, we stop right here and we just swap those two. And then it actually writes out a forwarding address. So the object that used to be in B now is in 1, so it leaves the 1 address there. And we repeat this. So this, the left scans until it finds free, the right scans until it finds an object, it swaps and then leaves a forwarding address. So it keeps repeating this process until those two pointers meet. So it'll repeat, and then finally when they meet, we've moved all the objects next to each other. So the actual, the actual code for implementing this is, it looks like this. Uh, and it's really, it's really very simple. You can see up there, we take a scan pointer and a free pointer. Those are the things that are moving through, through the heap. And then we basically just swap the two. We do a mem copy of one to the other, and then we're done. So unfortunately, uh, if we have, let's say, some Ruby code that looks like this, the, the, the objects are related to each other. They have a relationship with each other, so indicated by those arrows there. We have maybe some hash that points at a, points at a symbol and a string. Now, unfortunately, after we compact the heap, it'll end up looking like this, and now that hash points at two locations that no longer contain the objects that we were looking for. So because of that, we have to make another pass through the heap and actually update those references so it points at the right thing. And this is a very easy algorithm. All we do is start at one end, and we just move along looking at each object to see, if it ha see what references that object has. If it has references, we look at the, follow those references, look for the forwarding addresses, and then we simply change the references to point at the forwarding addresses. So in this particular case, object number four, 
used to point at six and seven. Now it needs to point at five and three. So all we do is update those arrows to point at five and three, and then continue on through the, through the heap updating references like that. So once we reach the end of the, end of the heap, we're done, and we've updated all the references. Everything is working. Yay. Then the final step is to go through and change all these forwarding addresses back to free, free slots. And now our heap is back to a normal Ruby heap, and all the objects are moved next to each other. So I wanted to show a little bit of the updating, update reference code. And I'm just going to show it for, uh, uh, just for arrays. But basically, all we do is we have this C code that basically iterates through every single one of these slots in, the, slots in your heap and then calls an update references function down there at the bottom and updates the references for those objects. Now, if we go look at that, that update object references is actually an, a very large function. And what it is is it's looking at the type of the object. And depending on the type, it updates the references. So for example, one of the, one of the things is an array. This is a case statement inside of that function where we handle arrays. And we say, OK, well, if this is a shared array, we update that pointer. If it's not a shared array, then we go through and update all the references inside of the array. So that's all we have to do. We're done. It was that easy. Yay. <laughs> Yay. So there's, there's actually um, the, the cost of this algorithm is that we have to visit each slot three times. We have to visit every object once in order to move all of the objects. We have to visit every object again in order to uh, update the references. And we have to re visit every object again in order to remove those free, free slots. In the future, we can probably remove that last step and just treat these forwarding pointers as free slots. But you can see we have to walk through every single object twice, at least. So compaction challenges, I want to talk about some of the challenges we've had implementing this, implementing this uh, compactor at work. Uh, one, all of, these, all of these problems boil down to essentially object addresses. So every object in your system, every Ruby object, has an address, an address in memory. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the code out there, specifically the C code out there today, uh, believes that these addresses are constant, that the, the address for that particular object will never change. Now, unfortunately, uh, this, we ha we'll have some C code that says points at this object, and it says, oh, this, this address number four, that'll never change, right? It's fine. Now, unfortunately, with a compactor, that is no longer true. So uh, the, the primary offender of this, this uh, rule is specifically C code. And we're going to look at those, look at how to address these C code issues, because we have to address this in order for it to actually be a production ready thing. The three problem cases we'll look at are C extensions and how we dealt with that, hash tables, and also global variables in C. So for C extensions, the way we dealt with that is um, uh, a little trick I used. Now, so far, the object relationships we've looked at have been hashes that point at strings and symbols. And these are just normal, normal Ruby objects, right? Now, these, these are regular references. And we can handle these regular references pretty easily because they're implemented inside of MRI. We know how to update those references. We can fix them. But what if we have some C code over here, some C data structure that points at our Ruby object? How do we, how do we actually handle that? Uh, so, if we, don't, if we don't handle that, then the garbage collector could actually free the hash, uh, and then our, our, co our C code would explode. Right? If, you have, if you have C code, uh, it has to do something to make sure that that Ruby hash stays around. And if that Ruby hash doesn't stay around, then that C code must explode. So how, do we, how, how does the C code actually handle this? So, the C code has to say, well, I want that hash to stay around because I'm referencing it. And in order to do that, in order to do that, the C extension author actually has to call a function called RBGC mark. So they call RBGC mark on that Ruby object in order to say, hey, I'm still holding a reference to this. Uh, don't free this. Don't free this object. Now, what's interesting is if you remember back to our mark, our mark sweep uh, algorithm, you'll note that the way we actually marked references was via a function called GC mark, not RBGC mark. So actually, internal data structures, normal, regular Ruby objects, use this function called RBGC mark, so, or called GC mark. So in this way, we can differentiate between objects that are held by C extensions versus objects that are held by just normal, regular Ruby objects. 
So in this particular case, we can say, OK, well, you know, don't move that hash. It's being held onto by a C extension. Uh, but the string and the symbol, those are OK to move. OK, we can move both of those because they're just being held by a Ruby, a Ruby object, and we know how to fix those. Now, uh, I want to prime you for questions to ask me later. What happens if you have a C extension that references a symbol like this but doesn't mark it? What is that case? What do we do then? So please ask me that later. Yay. Uh, so let's look at hash tables. Uh, this is probably the least interesting problem, but also most frustrating, or maybe both of those. I'm not sure. It's, it's an interesting slash fun and not fun problem, and you'll see why here. So a normal hash table, a hash table, all it does is it has some sort of uh, bucketing system where we take, some, we take some value and we compute a hash code for that value. And based on that hash code, we stick, the, stick that data structure into some bucket. Right? So we have some key value pair, for example. Uh, we have some hashing function that computes a hash for the key. And say, in this case, it computed six, and it stores the key and value there. That way, later on, what we can do is take that same key, uh, compute the hash key for it again, and get access to that value. We're all, we're all familiar with this. We know roughly how hashes work. We use these day to day, I think, especially if you're a rack user. <laughs> uh, so the default hashing function, unfortunately, is this. Uh, and you don't need to understand the C code. I'm going to point out exactly to you what the problem is. The default hashing function actually uses the memory address. That uses the object address. So if you take the hash value of some Ruby object, it's going to be the object address. Now, the problem is that if that object moves, well, that address changes. Uh, and if that address changes, well, then the hash code changes for that object. Uh, and if that hash code changes, then we can no longer look up the object in the hash, right? So this, uh, this is an issue for hashes. Uh, yes, I said this. If the address changes, then uh, so does the hash. So how do, we, how do we fix this? Clearly, if you use some key in the hash, we want to be able to look up that value again. So what do we do? Well, the solution that we have taken, unfortunately, is to don't allow hash keys to move. So we just say, these, these certain groups of objects, they cannot move. OK. Uh, now, I put a little star by that because I want to give you, feed you another question, which is, what about strings? Uh, so ask me this later in the Q&A section. Or if we, have, if we don't have time, ask me over a beer. Uh, so the final thing I want to talk about is uh, global variables. And I'm going to show you an example of global variables that we had to deal with uh, in MRI. And I sent a patch to fix this. Um, so in this case, we have a global variable here called separator. And this separator actually points at a string called slash. It's just slash. You'll know, you'll know the slash from when you do file.join. Okay? Now, that, that global variable is used again down here when you say file.join. It says, OK, take those two things, join them together with that string, and we're great. Now, what happens if we assign the separator to nil and then gc? So let's take a look at this code. We say assign file colon separator to nil and the other one to nil. Then we do a GC and then we start. You'll actually get a segv. Uh, and that is because, I'll show you in a minute, it, this segv does not occur with JRuby. So I, I shouldn't plug JRuby since I'm on the MRI team. But <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so the reason this segv happens is because we have this string in memory, and we actually have three references to it. We have the global variable in C pointing at that object. And then we have these two Ruby constants pointing at the object. Now, this code here that I, that's in the lower right, I'm assigning those global objects to those uh, constants to uh, nil. And then we do a GC start. Uh, so we assign those to nil. We do a GC start. Uh, the GC says, well, there's no references to that slash object anymore, so I'm going to free it. Uh, so it frees it, because the global variable does not know how to mark it. Uh, so it frees it. And then uh, when the final file.join runs, everything blows up, because we have no reference to that object anymore. So in this particular case, uh, what we did, or what I did, was submit a patch to stop using this global variable. So look up the value rather than, rather than use some global variable as a cache. Uh, so this 
issue is similar to compaction because uh, we're not able to update, update the references of those global variables, which is what, that, what, that, uh, what the compactor needs to do. So global variables, the, the hash issue and the global variable issue are very similar because when those objects move, we can't update, we can't update those references. So the general problem is essentially that um, we can only update Ruby objects to point at other Ruby objects. Uh, and we can update those, we can only update uh, core classes to MRI. So I want to, I showed a few examples of the issues. Uh, there are many issues, but we've fixed them one by one piecemeal, and uh, it seems to be working most of the time. So I want to show you a result of the compaction. We're actually using, we've used the compactor in production, and I want to share some of the results with you that we found. Uh, this is an example of a Rails heap. I'm just going to show a bare, bare uh, Rails uh, project. So the compaction code looks like this. Essentially, we open a, open a file. We write out the heap to the file. We have to specifically compact the heap by calling gc.compact. Then we write it out again. So we run this with the Rails script runner. Uh, now, if we graph all the graph what the slots look like, if we graph the heap, before, the, before we run compaction, the heap looks like this. Now, each of these columns are a page. And we talked about pages earlier. Uh, each of the red dots are objects that we cannot move. Each of the green dots are objects that we can move. Uh, and each of the white, the white location, that is free space. And these pages are sorted by the number of objects that cannot be moved. Now, after we compact, if we, if we look at this graph again, it looks something like this. Or you can see now we've got all of these green objects moved to one side of the heap and we have all of the white space on the other side of the heap, and we can allocate into there. So uh, before compaction, we had uh, 552 pages. And of those pages, 528 of those pages have space on them for allocation. Now, the problem with this is, is that every time we write to a page, that page may be copied to a child process, where we're using Unicorn in production, which is a forking web server. So copy on write optimizations are important to us. Now, after compaction, uh, we only 167 of our 552 pages uh, have space for allocation. So maybe only 167 of those pages can possibly be copied where previously 528 could. Now, this lower number is better for copy on write optimizations because we would like to have fewer pages be copied to child processes. Now, we can actually improve this uh, you saw all those red dots at the bottom. If we can fix those red objects such that there are fewer of them, we can improve this number. Uh, ideally, we would have no red objects, but you saw earlier we have those issues where there are some that we cannot move. Uh, there are some that we've, some that I didn't show in this presentation that we say, oh, we can't move them, but with a bit of development work, we can. So I want to show you some of the heap graphs, well, a heap graph from our production application. Um, and the reason I didn't include many of these graphs is because they're very big. We have a very large heap in production. This is what it looks like after compaction. So you can see it is quite wide. Now, the good news is, I mean, the bad news is, is there's a lot of red objects on here. The good news is, is that it follows the trend of a basic Rails application. So we can say a basic Rails app is generally uh, representative of the heap. So why compact? Uh, I've talked about how to build a compactor, and I gave one reason. The one reason is to free up space like this. We want to free up, if we can, we want to free up those pages. Uh, the other is for a copy on write optimizations, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. We use a forking web server, Unicorn. And in a forking setup, all the child processes share memory with the parent process. But as soon as either of them write to those processes, we get that memory copied, and that increases the overall memory used on the servers. So we want to reduce that. Uh, so, for example, in this case, before compaction, basically all of these pages could be written to. All of them have free space on it. So potentially all of them could be copied to the child process. Whereas after compaction, you can see here, only those pages can be copied to the child process. And these pages remain shared among the, among the uh, parent and child processes. Now, I want to talk about reality here for a minute, unfortunately. Let's get back to reality. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, I want to talk a little bit about agile, agile development. So agile, agile development tells us to fail fast. 
Now, I've created a new development style, a new better development style that I call uh, fail continuously. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually created a new uh, continuous integration server where, where we actually uh, <laughs> continuously fail. And, and today I'm really proud to present uh, a new product from Adequate Industries. It's called um, Aaron CI, where your tests will fail constantly. <laughs> So I guess I, I'm coming around here making a tongue-in-cheek tongue assertion that I, I am somewhat of a failure, and it is true, because if we look at the real-world results of this uh, compactor, we saw in production maybe only a 2% uh, improvement or a 2% 2 reduction in uh, memory usage on our production machines. Um, this is nowhere near the amount that we expected. Because if you, look at these, if you look at these graphs here, we'd expect, OK, well, you know, maybe in this case, we have most of this shared. And presumably, only 30% of it can be copied. So you'd expect us to have maybe, I don't know, 60% reduction in memory. But uh, that's not true, uh, or a 30% improvement. It's not true. And, and we're trying to figure out why. Like I said, this is ongoing development. And I want to share with you two possibilities or two reasons why we're not seeing the improvements that we expected. There are two possibilities. One is uh, essentially poor compaction. Uh, and the other one is maybe a small percentage of the heap is actually compact. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I glossed over some stuff in this presentation, some stuff, lots of stuff. Uh, now, if we look at this before compaction graph, I've divided up these pages into four, four parts. And the reason I've divided these pages into four parts is because if you write to one page, the entire page does not get copied. Only 25% of the page gets copied. Okay? So the problem is that this free space, the 25% of every single page that's open, that particular free space that can possibly be copied may be equal to this free space here. So if that's the case, then we'll see no improvements in, in uh, copy on write. So if the number of quarter pages is equal to the number of full pages after compaction, then we won't see any improvements. Now, the other possibility is that maybe the Ruby heap is actually much smaller than the amount of memory that we've allocated. We talked a little bit earlier about hashes being allocated in one area and Ruby's GC allocated in a different area. Maybe Ruby's GC is just a small percentage of the memory that's being used. So compaction will have very little effect on it. Maybe it's large. Maybe it's small. So we have to measure that. And I want to talk a little bit about measuring. And then I'm going to hurry because I'm totally over time. We're measuring this now with a thing called malloc stack logging. Uh, and what this is, is we say, every time you make a call to malloc, we log the stack. So we see who made that call and figure out what the problem is. I'm going to show you how to do this on OS X, but you can also do this with Valgrind and the, what's called the massive uh, allocator. So look up that later. The way to do this with OS X is you simply set a, a variable called malloc stack logging, no compact. And what this does is it logs every single malloc call. Now, you put the process to sleep because you can only analyze live processes because of a uh, thing called address randomization, which don't just, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> so you put the process to sleep and say, OK, in another terminal, ask for the malloc history. Give me all, all by size for that particular PID. I just put in some PID. That's uh, obviously not the PID you're going to have. Uh, so what that does is it actually prints out all of the live allocated things. So this malloc stack logging logs every allocation, logs every free. And the malloc history actually takes that history and calculates what is allocated now and what are the stacks for those particular things. So a sample of the stack log is like this. I know you can't read it. One record looks something like this, where we say, OK, we had one call for some amount of bytes, and that's what the stack looked like. So we can see who made that call. Now, I wrote some code to process it. Uh, and it's kind of small, but I wanted, to point out, I wanted to point out a few things about this processing code. Uh, one is that I use the flip-flop operator. Uh, the other is that I use a protected method. <laughs> and the other is I have a method here with no parentheses on it. <laughs> 
So I am using all the worst practices from this from this conference. So if we use this, if we use this code to process process the output of this mallet stack logging, we can see an empty program will have something like this, where 17% uh, only 17% of the heap is managed by the garbage collector, where 83% of it is managed by the system, and that's for an empty program. This very basic empty program here. Uh, now we can actually we can actually adjust this. Okay, yes, thank you, Aaron. Good job. We can we can adjust this. Let's say uh, we change the number of slots that we initialize with. Let's say we start out with a hundred thousand Ruby objects and get the stack for that. Uh, this is what it'll look like. So we started with 17 with an empty program, and we can actually increase the amount that's used by the garbage collector. So we're testing in the, this in production right now. Unfortunately, logging this data is slow. So we're trying to come up with a better way to do it. The test results will guide us how to actually fix this and improve the performance of the compactor. So uh, depending on what the test results are, it will tell us where we need to focus. So if the test results show that uh, most of the heap is taken up by the garbage collector, then we need to fix all of those red dots and allow those to move. If it turns out that the uh, Ruby GC is a small percentage of the heap, then we need to allow variable width objects and start allocating hashes into Ruby's, Ruby's garbage collector. Now the truth is that both of these things need to happen, uh, but the test results will tell us which one to focus on so that we can get the uh, best, best results for this. So I'm gonna finish up here because I'm way over time. I will summarize why should we compact. Uh, compaction allows us to save, us, save memory in two ways, uh, which is freeing up, freeing up pages and also improving copy on write performance. Uh, we've developed this, this uh, patch as open source software, which you can go check out here. Um, the plan is to upstream this sometime this year. I'm hoping to get it done by September for Ruby Kaigi. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all. Thank you very much. I'm so happy I could be here. All right, questions? There you go. Yeah, you can go to the mic. Hi, um, yes. I'm gonna get a new laptop, so I was wondering when will we get a new edition of stickers with uh, Gorbachev and Chuchu? <laughs> well, there's no, there's no new edition, no new edition right now. I brought stickers with me. I, if I am invited back next year, I will definitely bring new stickers. We, we, um, I, I brought, I brought stickers. They're just the, we've had the same stickers for a year. We recently moved, so my, my uh, brand manager. Uh, my wife <laughs> hasn't had time to design new ones, so we'll, I'll have some next year. <laughs> awesome. And now for a more serious one. Yeah. Well, what will happen with object IDs since they depend on the memory where object was allocated? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. So the question is what, what will happen with object IDs? Object IDs are based on, uh, based on the, the location of the object in memory. Uh, so when you call object ID, that number is directly related to where that object is in memory. And the way that we're handling that is we actually uh, lazily figure out what the object ID is and cache it on the object. Uh, and then we have another, a separate lookup table for collisions. So uh, basically what will happen is your object has no object ID until you call object ID. Uh, then it will calculate the object ID based on either the address or uh, if that value has already been taken, some, some other value. Uh, so the moral of the story is please do not call object ID. <laughs> you can do it, but it could be slow in the future. Yeah. If, uh... There's this expectation that the stuff in the in the, the green, the red and green, that, that 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 would just be shared. But can't those same uh, can't the things in, in, in those pages also change over time and, and the copy on write could kick in for those pages? Sure, sure, yes, that's a great question. So the question is uh, can't those the the red and the green objects that I showed earlier move around and or or get freed or have something new be written there over time uh, and then have that ruin the copy on write optimizations? Uh, and the answer is yes, it's, it's possible. Uh, but what we did is 
All of that, all of those objects that I showed you are immediately after Rails boot. So it's all just code that we've loaded in and um, initialization objects. So those will likely not change. Those should be long-lived long -lived objects. But yes, it's possible. OK, yeah, I, I guess I just don't intuitively know. Like, Active Record is in there just like messing everything up after you've loaded it and like, you know, messing around with, with singletons and, and whatnot. I, I don't know how much it causes that stuff to. Sure, no, the, the, the code, most of, that, most of the stuff that I showed there is just uh, compiled Ruby code. It'll never, that stuff will never change. Um, if we were doing compaction later on, like after each request or something like that, yeah, it would, it would completely ruin it, yeah. Okay, I figured the answer was something like that. Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right. Oh, okay. Hello. Ooh. Hi. Uh, uh, thanks for that. It was uh, really good to see the internals of Ruby. Oh, thank you. Uh, Two-part question, actually. Uh, yeah. In the loop, does it go through the entire heap or just a page? So, can you say ask that again? Uh, you mentioned about the loop for uh, compaction. Does uh, yeah. it go through the whole page or the whole heap? Uh, it goes through the entire heap. Okay. So. Is it possible that uh, a pointer, uh, after moving the object, you leave a pointer there, and that pointer itself could move later? Is, does that happen? A pointer, what do you mean? So the way you're moving the object, yeah. uh, can a pointer also move? Uh, I, is it even possible? Uh, no. I mean, you can move. So the object, the object will get moved, but after we've updated all of the references, then None of, the, none of the Ruby objects should reference pointers that aren't actual Ruby objects. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up there. Hello, Aaron. Hello. Um, how does uh, an anom uh, anonymous class uh, act in this um, compacting? Is it going to stick around forever, or is it going to be moved like a normal object? Uh, all objects are moved equally. It doesn't. This and if doesn't I assign care. it to a glo to a constant, like if I say I don't know a equals. Yep. It does. It it doesn't care. Okay. Great. There you go. Hi, Aaron. Yes. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, just now you mentioned you got uh, about two percent uh, optimization, right? About the memory location. Yeah. Like. I have no idea how uh, the compression uh, script is uh, written, but one thing that I am quite uh, confused is uh, like you are trying to uh, free, free the the whole uh, patch, right? If there is no, it, if uh, the what? I'm quite curious uh, because uh, a location of the the new object right, might be faster than your uh, compression script. So I mean that uh, you are un unable to f uh, free the whole uh, page. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so the question is, um, how does the um, how can the compactor keep up with allocation? Yes. Yes. Of new object. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. This right now it's it basically stops the world. This is a stop the world compactor. Uh, and you have to actually call an object, or you have to call a method called GC compact. So we had to, we modified our modified our boot process to say, okay, um, before before we actually listen for requests, we compact everything, and that pauses the process for maybe our our particular heap. Uh, it would pause the process for about 100 milliseconds, and then continue on. So it doesn't actually allow any allocations during the compaction phase. All right, cool. Uh, okay. There's one in the back. There's a, there's a mic there. You can go to the mic. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I want to ask, um, you mentioned about the uh, Ruby managed memory as well as system managed memory. Uh, may I know, I think it's a weird question, but why do we need to separate these two type of memory management? Why can't Ruby manage their own memory internally? Uh, and you also mentioned about the 40 kb size. Sure. Uh, why can't it be dynamic? Yeah. Sure, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, why can't why can't Ruby manage all of the all of the memory? Why do we have this 40 byte uh, 40 byte limit? Uh, 
right? Uh, so, well, <laughs> the answer is that garbage collect GC, algor GC algorithms are a lot easier when you have a uh, fixed width fixed width slot. So with a fixed width fixed width slot, it's much easier to write a GC, uh, and I think that's basically the origin of it. We can have. I don't think there's any particular um, limitation or reason why we couldn't store everything in Ruby's garbage collector. Essentially, it's just that someone needs to do the work to implement that. Uh, so if I had to guess, the reason we have fixed width slots is historic reasons, Matt's, maybe? I, yes. He's not paying attention, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I will make that the the uh, the answer. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, you say something about like uh, the red dot, let's say the hash. Uh, you cannot move the location because of the G uh, C. Um, do you think such red dots will affect the way we write code? Let's say like. Um, having a lot of the uh, uh, object that has and uh, that's unmovable with actually affect the performance, and therefore we may end up writing few hash or like that kind of stuff. Like, right. Do you think we affect our way of writing code? Right, right. So the question is, will the do the I guess is the uh, behavior of the garbage collector or the implementation details of the garbage collector will that impact the way that we write code? Uh, it shouldn't. Um, I don't think that it should impact it. I think, I think most of those red objects we can actually eliminate. So I think that with a bit more development work, we can reduce it such that the percentage of objects that can't be moved is very low. And you would, I mean, it would be so low that there is no reason for you to know that it is even a thing. So no, I don't think it would impact it. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you for having me.